Good afternoon to everyone on the East Coast and good morning on the West Coast. Thank you for joining us for this webinar on early stage corporate debt solutions. Covering these topics today are Richard Bowman, Senior Vice President, Director of Debt Placement, and Stefan Spizek, Senior Vice President of Business Development. A little background on Rich. He has over 30 years of experience in consulting, commercial lending, and equipment leasing, most notably in high technology and life science industries. In 2003, Rich founded Debt Advisors Group, a debt consulting arm of Capital Advisors Group. Currently, Rich focuses on business development on the West Coast. As Senior Vice President, Stefan supervises business development in the New England and Central region. Since 2010, Stefan has also overseen the debt consulting business in, in the East Coast and Midwest territories. He joined Capital Advisors Group in 2006 as Director of Marketing overseeing the company's brand strategy, product positioning, content development, web strategy, advertising, public relations, and direct marketing. Now, before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items I'd like to cover. You'll notice an area within the module on your screen where you may submit questions at any time during the course of the webinar. Rich and Stefan will review these questions and will answer them during the Q&A at the end of the webinar. I'll also be sending out an email uh, after the webinar with a link to the presentation with contact info for both Rich and Steph. I'm going to hand the presentation now over to Rich. Rich, take it away. Thank you, Shane, for the kind introduction, and, and thank you, everybody that's in attendance uh, and has interest in our topic today. Um, capital advises. Uh, we'll, let's talk a little The agenda really is going to be what we're going to cover today in this, the outline. Um, who is Capital Advisors Debt Placement and what do we do? Um, why focus on early stage debt? It's really a niche market that is really not covered very well. I don't even think anyone's even compiled what, uh, how much it, it, of it is, is done each year. Um, is debt financing right for you? Uh, debt can be both good and bad uh, for companies. So we're going to take a look at some of the reasons why you'd want to do it and, and some of the reasons when it probably was not appropriate. Who are the players? These, are, as I mentioned before, are very niche lenders. Um, we break them down into different groups and characteristics within those groups, like venture banks and venture lenders and some late stage royalty type lenders. Um, what is the process? Uh, we have a specific process we've developed over the years that we've found very successful, uh, focusing mainly on runway extension and competitive sourcing, and we'll share that with you. And then finally, the anatomy, how is a debt deal done? What's the timing of it? How long does it take? What's involved? And, and really, how, what's, what, what is the, how, how do we look at the entire process? So that's really what we'll be covering today. Shane, if you could move on to the next uh, slide. So Capital Advisors Group. Um, Capital Advisors Group was founded in 1991 as a cash management firm. Um, I joined the firm in 2003 to add this debt consulting practice. Um, prior to joining Capital Advisors, I had spent, as Shane mentioned, about 25 years as a lender. And I had seen many things come, coming in from brokers and what they were both good and bad. And one of the things that really attracted me to Capital Advisors is this thing where they are an SEC registered investment advisor. Uh, the requirements for that is that you have to, at all times, have the fiduciary best interest of your client at heart. And I think that's one of the most important things, and it drives us to being always working in the best interest in parallel with all the needs of our clients. And I think differentiates us from a lot of the different brokers and, and other intermediaries that you may see out there. Uh, some of the statistics on what we've done over the years. Uh, we've got more than 1,200 term sheets in our library which gives us a very deep, a uh, lot of mark, good market points. And quite honestly, as a lender, which I was for many years, you only have the term sheets and proposals that you put out yourself. And you hear bits and pieces about other lenders, but you really don't understand them. By our, our, the approach that we have with hundreds of uh, thousand lenders, uh, we really have a much better concept on the entire market and who's doing what and what, what the advantages of each 
lender is and where you can drive each proposal to. Um, you know, we've got on our team now probably well over 50 years of experience between myself and Jimmy Wynn, our analyst, and Stefan and other people that have been helping us in the market. And uh, again, this is a very limited niche market. We have probably more experience at it than almost any other firm out there. Uh, finally, we, we work in a very competitive uh, process. It's often been compared um, to the lending tree type model. And we work with 50 lenders that we've placed deals with over the years. Quite frankly, we work with mostly the same 12 to 15 lenders over and over again. Um, we'd like to move on to the next page. Why corporate debt solutions? Uh, debt is a very important part of the capital structure of any firm, particularly an early stage firm. It's very important that you get the structure right and the timing of it, make sure that it's correct. Uh, some of the generalized benefits that, that you might see from debt and these early things is um, debt with less dilute of ownership than equity. Uh, there is usually a, typically a, an equity, small equity component on each of these deals, uh, which we refer to as an equity kicker, and it's always less than one half or one percent of the deal. So when when we when anyone talks about the equity kicker it's really not a significant part of any corporation, unlike equity, which would be more, much more uh, dilutive, that much more uh, taking up much more of the ownership position. Uh, properly structured debt and can extend the cash runway. Uh, that's important, particularly if there's a valuation change in the firm. So if you're just gonna do debt and there really is no valuation change by what the extra runway, that's really not a good reason to do debt. So what we're looking at is trying to calculate the runway extension that a debt may do for you and then what, what else might happen in the firm that would create valuation change and give you a real good reason to do debt. Um, one of the reasons we talk about below is you know debt can be a bridge to milestones or business product development, break even, profitability, clinical trial information, whatever. Uh, these are all good reasons that, that you may want to do debt. Um, our complete understanding of this market and the data points we have really make uh, are very valuable and we, we, we're here really to share them with you and help you do the best uh, or achieve the best uh, type of debt for your, for your company. Um, at this point, I'd like to pass the uh, presentation on to Stefan and Stefan, take it from here. Thanks, Rich. So at this point, we kind of want to get into how you might approach considering debt financing. The, you know, as we're a we're an advisor in these transactions, as Rich said, and we are our goal is to act as a fiduciary. So, so when we're hired by a company to help um, uh, get a put a debt transaction in place. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to guide the company through this process uh, as if we were an extension, you know, of their finance group. So we, as debt has become a more popular form of financing, um, it, it's our primary goal to make sure that companies are using it properly because there, there's certainly ways in which um, you can use debt that would not be to your benefit um, as a company. So this is just kind of a quick list of questions that uh, give you a sense of, of, of how we help consider um, if debt could be appropriate. And the first thing is just specifically how will it help? Um, if, it's, if, if you just want to do debt to add it to the balance sheet with no specific goal in mind, that might not be the best approach um, because there's certainly, um, Rich mentioned, you know, some of the things that go along with, with, with a debt transaction, including giving up a small piece of equity, um, you know, in, in you, you know, this this is not a, an equity round. You got to pay it back, and it's going to be with interest, um, and and you know that could that could create some cash flow issues or whatever else. So we want to figure out specifically how it's going to help the company, what the goal is there, and what and then if it makes sense, then how much is it going to take to get there? Because there are certainly determining factors that uh, th that we take into account um, to figure out how much um, debt leverage, let's say, could be appropriate for any, any given company. And so we try to understand what it's going to take to help the company get to those goals or milestones. And, you know, is it going to be near-term OPEX or CAPEX, or are we looking for longer runway extension? That could help us figure out, um, you know, the structure of the deal. Maybe it would be best if it were tranched 
um, if it's pure runway extension to, to, to help extend that runway just a little a little longer. So that helps kind of figure out structure. And then um, obviously for a purely venture back company, uh, you know, there's there's investors that have uh, skin in the game, and it's a question of uh, if if there's any interest in dilution. Um, you know that it's been a big sticking point in the recent past that that warrants are part of debt financing transactions. Uh, so we've seen the emergence of more success fees, um, which is sort of a one-time payout uh, upon change of control or IPO or or or, or some other um, um, inflection point in the company uh, versus giving shares in the company, which obviously have have unlimited upside. So. Um, so there's been a bit of pushback on that warrant piece over the recent past. And then to understand which lenders could be most appropriate, uh, you know, we, we, um, we work with tens, close to 100 lenders that are out there uh, in all sorts of different capacities. Um, they focus on different vertical markets. Um, they base their, their debt structures on, on, you know, different characteristics and parameters. Um, and so it, it um, the stage of the company is, is one of those factors that, that we work to understand uh, to help determine which lenders would be most appropriate. And then um, one important prerequisite is if a company is burning cash without revenue um, or, or burning cash with revenue, um, but the cash burn is so high that the company has less than 12 months remaining, uh, that could make the, the structure a little more difficult. Uh, but um, but it, you know sometimes depending on on revenue or there, there's there's structures out there that are you know that, that are dependent upon multiples of revenue um, so so sometimes the cash life might not be as important but uh, but a straight cash burning company without revenue absolutely needs to have 12 months of cash remaining to to get the best terms in most circumstances and then current investors. Uh, again, this is for, for cash burning companies, VC back companies. Um, you know, obviously those top tier, deep pocketed, um, venture backed, uh, that the investors in these, in these venture back companies matter. So sometimes lenders will be willing to lend, um, to a cash burning company specifically based on who those investors are. Um, and if they want to have relationships with those investors that they don't already have or want to improve relationships. So sometimes there's some political motivation, um, uh, in terms of what deals can be done based on, uh, based on the investors there. And then, um, how much equity is into the company and how much is, uh, how much is left. So, you know, uh, an A round of $10 million, um, you know, there's, there's less on the line there for investors, uh, versus a company that's done, done a C round, um, and, you know, maybe a $40 million and has, you know, 70 or $80 million already into the company. So the stakes raised, right, as the, as the rounds, uh, as the company grows and, and, and moves through its development stages. Um, so, you know, the stakes get higher, the investors are less, would be less willing uh, to, to abandon the company. So it makes the credit that much more secure from a lender's perspective. So that's something to think about. Um, also on the healthcare side, if the company's facing near-term regulatory risk, especially if it doesn't have a deep pipeline, um, you know, if there's a lead asset, uh, without a deep pipeline that's facing, um, a decision, uh, from, from FDA, um, you know, sometimes investors might be reluctant to face that binary risk. Uh, so thumbs up, thumbs down uh, in the near term uh, tends to tends to be a bad for the for the credit process from the lender's perspective. And then uh, lastly, you know, any issues with uh, with liens on IP and, and licensing partners. You know, there's there's some licensing partners. Obviously, if a company's in licensed technology, um, some licensing partners are known to be more difficult to work with with other than others. Um, and also, you know, um, it, it's tough to, to get into a deal and, and find out that, you know, the IP is in a shell company over in the Isle of Wight and, uh, there's, there's zero way to get access to it legally. Um, that'll, that'll throw a wrench in the works, uh, pretty quickly. So we work to understand, you know, if there's any potential IP issues, uh, right at the onset there. And then getting into uses of funds, I think Rich already went through this uh, at a high level, but, you know, 
we've we've seen um, over the just the past few years and deals we've done, um, we've seen deals done for for all of these reasons. So um, obviously financing pipeline activity. So um, you know in some cases if there's an advanced uh, again we're talking about biotechs um, and life sciences, but if there's you know if there's an advanced uh, asset at the a lead asset that may have FDA approval. Um, there's in some cases you can uh, leverage that asset to to accelerate the rest of the pipeline, um, or you know extending uh, extending the uh, the the financing for a lead asset to get it through certain approvals or milestones. Um, obviously, equipment we you know we deal with companies that are working on equipment leases and loans, um, help them try to get sort of a, a better cash flexibility on on expensive equipment. Uh, refinancing, you know, we we see that quite often, where um, maybe an interest-only period on an existing loan is about to expire, uh, and that's going to really hit the cash flow. And so you want to you want to extend an I/O period, and 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 sometimes uh, an, an incumbent lender may be willing to do that, uh, or it, it might take an entire refi um, to to reset the clock on an interest-only period. Um, and then you know, just straight growth, general general financing, health companies. Um, that are heading toward an IPO, um, hedge the downside risk. So, you know, sometimes, obviously, as you go on a roadshow for an IPO, um, maybe the feedback isn't great. Maybe you might have to delay that IPO. Um, and and as, you're, as you're working through that process, maybe you don't want to necessarily be running down to the bare bones on cash life. Um, so, so we've seen that scenario. Um, uh, sometimes concurrent equity and debt. So, you know, I've uh, been speaking with a company recently that decided they wanted to do $25 million um, in their next financing round. And sometimes, you know, we can help companies understand that, you know, maybe you can offset some of the full dilution of an equity round of $25 million by layering in some debt, taking a little less equity, um, and, and moving the company forward that way. Um, so, you know, oftentimes that's, uh, that's a good way to do it from, from management perspective. And then uh, finally, you know, final finance, financing for a commercial launch. Um, uh, that that uh, obviously, if a company doesn't get acquired, um, is going to be launching commercially. Uh, that's expensive, and so um, you want to have plenty of uh, plenty of dry powder uh, for that for that huge uh, huge milestone. So that's another reason that uh, that we've seen companies do these types of transactions. So I will uh, I'll pass it back to Rich for uh, for the different types of lenders that may, might be appropriate for for different stages. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Uh, we're going to be focusing today on the healthcare venture debt market, which differentiates itself a little bit from high tech and some of the other early stage markets. Um, we, as a company, have about 95% of our uh, capital. Uh, investment clients are from the healthcare market, so it's one that we're more familiar with and have spent more time in. Uh, so we developed the, in this market, we see really three types of lenders. There's the venture banks, which are made up of uh, probably SVB being the largest and began about 1982, uh, Comerica, which came out of the Imperial Bank franchise out of LA, and more recently, people like Square One and Bridge Bank have entered that space. Um, then in the, the venture debt providers, we're looking at people like Oxford Finance, Hercules Growth Capital, Midcap, uh, Solar Capital, Triple Point, uh, and, and Western Technology Investments that's really been around the longest, another lender that started in the 80s. Uh, finally, within the recent years, we've had another product data, which I'm calling Structured Finance. Um, these companies have grown up and really work with later stage companies that either are about to get FDA approval or already have it. These are people like CRG, Healthcare Royalty, Orbamed Royalty, Pharmacon, and a number of others. Um, so those are really the players in that they, we, we see over and over again in the healthcare market. And let me talk a little bit about our process, how we, what our approach is when we go to these markets. Initially, we do a consultative of approach with a potential borrower. We really look into the, his business, his structure, his priorities, and we look at it as if we were a lender ourselves. Um, this is really probably the time we spend the most time in talking to someone. 
Um, with that client, we agree on what would be the appropriate deal size, structure, lenders, what he may be eligible for. Uh, and again, we spend a lot of time, we usually do a runway analysis that can calculate uh, what uh, he would be able to typically pick up in, in the market. So that before we even got, get to a point where we might do put, put together a, an RFP, we've pretty much vetted the whole process and very much gotten in front of it. Uh, we take a look at which debt types he may want to look at, bank debt, venture debt, or this light, later stage one for, for companies that are, again, a selling product and have FDA approval, um, or structured finance. And sometimes we'll take a look at a couple of these and determine later that based on the terms and conditions which one's best. Uh, we then have, we have a proprietary model that we evaluate these terms under and talk to our client and get feedback from them and then probably go back and negotiate terms with the, with the top two or three lenders and deal. And that's how we drive the process really to get to the optimal term sheet and, and very much a competitively sourced deal. Um, at this point, I'd like to pass it back to Stefan again uh, to have him talk about some other aspects of the health care term debt. So, so this slide is a little busy. It sort of speaks for itself, but it's, uh, this is an extension of, of, of the slide that Rich was just discussing in terms of when it might be most appropriate to, to approach each of these types of lenders. So, um, again, healthcare specific, but... Um, you know, you can, as as he discussed, some of the banks that are in the market, um, you know, bank debt tends to be there first uh, before all others, uh, just sort of by the natural extension that, you know, any company that starts uh, needs a bank account. Uh, and so there's a relationship with the bank there. Um, so, so banks will come in quite early uh, in the financing um, uh, life cycle to provide debt financing, um, sometimes, you know, as early as Series A. Um, and, and they tend to be smaller deal sizes. They might go up to 10 million, sometimes 15 in rare cases. Um, but, um, they, you know, they have much more stringent regulatory oversight in terms of how they have to view these credits. Um, these are basically non-performing loans. There's, um, you know, these are bets made on, on investors. So, um, you know, so they tend to do the smaller deal size, uh, but, but because they have all of the, the rest of the, the company's business, the operating account, whatever else, um, they tend to have a lower cost of capital because, you know, in fact, they are, they're, they're taking lower risk by having access to, to all of that, all of the rest of the banking operations. Um, so there could be potential covenants in there as they're more conservative. Um, and as companies grow and, and, and advance, um, banks, you know, will still be in the market, but they may need to syndicate as deals get higher, uh, larger um, along the way. So the next level, you'll you get into the non-bank specialty finance companies that are that are specifically set up for venture lending. Um, uh, Rich Rich and uh, suggested a few of them, you know, like Oxford Finance, uh, Hercules Horizon, and others. Um, um, so these, because they're not banks, um, they're on the early side. They're tending to make, you know, a lot more uh, bets on the on the VCs. Um, their deals, you know, they might go as small as five, but uh, but up to up to fifty million dollars, and in some rare cases, even more than that. Um, but but the venture debt guys, uh, uh, you know, can be there all along the way, depending on on the size of the deal. Um, obviously, less regulatory oversight. Um, and you know their their credit decisions are, are might be based on different factors than than the banks, but uh, but they can be there along the way. And then moving up to the next level of this structured finance group um, that sometimes gets into royalty based finance. Uh, so so this is a group that really emerged since uh, since the credit crisis of 2008. You know the the idea here is that. Um, there was a lot of cash on the sidelines when when the credit crisis hit, uh, and it was kind of looking for a home. And so some of that cash ended up in these um, larger kind of structured finance funds uh, focused uh, in the healthcare space. And interestingly enough, they you know they started out being very late stage, and and really the roots of these types of lenders were in um, running large. Um, royalty transactions on 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 specific product lines, so big you know big drugs that are already out on the market, 
um, they would buy royalties, um, and and um, and that's and they so they would provide companies financing with that royalty basis. And then they started pushing earlier and earlier and earlier, uh, and started bumping into venture debt. Um, interestingly, that that created quite a competitive environment that still exists today, um, where where these structured finance folks, um, some some funds are even still emerging. And they're pushing earlier and earlier. Really, we consider this group uh, that is a group that really tries to avoid regulatory risk under most circumstances, pretty much all circumstances. Um, however, there's some some funds that have come about that that might uh, might be taking that regulatory risk, maybe on the very late end of a regulatory decision, but um, but have really bumped up against that venture finance space. Um, and so the venture debt guys have had to become far more um, competitive than they once were, and that even pushes itself all the way down into the bank debt, where venture debt competes with bank debt. Um, so, so the, the entire market um, has really gone through a monumental shift over the last um, eight or nine years now, where uh, where we're seeing we've seen new players come in, and uh, and this slide just gives you a sense of when uh, when it might be appropriate to approach them. Um, so this is back to Rich, and this is a little sort of an extension of how we have seen things change over the years. Uh, yes, uh, I've been around the industry for quite a while, as, as it was indicated earlier, and really it, it started in the 80s, uh, mostly by equipment leasing companies, and uh, some you know that was also the time when SVB and WTI started up. And, uh, the deals were pretty simple. We used to work on a 12C, HP 12C scientific calculator. We could mostly calculate the important parts of interest rate and closing and that equity kicker component that I talked about, sometimes warrant, sometimes success fees. And, you know, Equitech came along in the late 80s and really introduced the first 100% uh, model uh, that's really used basically the same model today, a 36-month transaction to principal and uh, interest payments and uh, it's been expanded upon and other issues have been added. Uh, really then in, in 2001, uh, the big event occurred when the internet bubble burst and a lot of the equipment leasing companies or early lenders to this group went by the wayside, people like Phoenix Core, where I was, was employed at Condisco. Um, and as the market bounced back, uh, the lenders went to a more conservative cash collateralized the bank lenders went to a more conservative cash collateralized model. And then we came across some of these other aspects that we talk about in here, tranching, maturities, success fees, longer interest only periods, revenues. These are all very common components of the deals today. So you can see they're much more complex than they used to be. And having this, uh, the data points that we have, it even emphasizes how important it is to have those data points when looking at deals. and and being able to uh, calculate IRS for comparison uh, models and, and comparing apples to apples. So um, this is really, you, you have to have a pretty good understanding of all these different types of uh, structures and, and uh, the different aspects of it. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. So it's important to have a historical context that we've talked about. But one of the things you have to be careful about when you have a, you don't get sort of stuck at pigeonholed in what you've seen the last few years. So one of the advantages we have since we've been around since 2013, in the last 14, 15 years, is that we can really monitor trends in the industry. Uh, we use information that we've compiled uh, you know, terms of uh, the terms that you'll find in this niche market are much more uh, dynamic and flexible than, than I've seen in any other uh, lending market that I've been involved in, in my career. The lenders seem to have a lot more flexibility and a lot more variability. Anytime that we run a process, you'll see significant changes from their initial term sheet to where they finally end up. And uh, that's something that the, the lenders, the borrower really has to learn to take advantage of. So by monitoring the industry trends, we're able to look at things like interest only periods, back end balloons, success fees versus uh, warrants, as, as Stefan mentioned earlier. Uh, these are all important aspects in trying to get the most important deal. So you can look at it historically, I mean, you have to be able to look at what's going on in the market today. 
um, to really understand where it can be. And also the lenders have different aspects. When they raise new funds, they're more aggressive than they might be towards the end of a fund, wanting to put the dry powder to use. So there's lots of things that go into making up what is the best and the timing for each of them. Um, let's move into the next uh, slide here. And we can talk about how, uh, what, what the debt process here is at, at uh, Capital Advisors and, and what we see. Now I've seen these deals put together as quickly as, as 10 to 15 days and take as long as, as 90 days. Uh, typically when we run a process to get optimal results, we're looking at a four to eight week process. And keep in mind the last three to four weeks of that process are the due diligence that the lender will, will do prior to lending. Um, so we really start, I mentioned earlier in the consultation period, we spend a lot of time with the client making sure that, that uh, it's the debt's appropriate for them. Um, we find about one third of the clients that we talk to that think they want debt after we've, we've spoken to them and talked, tried to focus in on the reasons that they're doing it, it isn't appropriate for them, whether it's not appropriate at all or it's a timing issue that it may be. One of the last things you want to do is if you have just raised three years of cash, is to go out and layer in debt over and above that. It really doesn't have any impact on your, your runway extension. Um, so those are the type of things that we look at and we talk to clients and we model out from the value of the debt. Then if we've decided that it would be appropriate, both us and the client, we then would work, work for deal preparation. Uh, typically, we, we would put together an RFP uh, for the lenders and reach out to the appropriate lenders in the space, whether they be the, the different types that we've talked about, the venture banks, or venture lenders, or even the late stage one. And we would work with that. Uh, as far as lending sources, we, we know which ones are based on the size structure, the client needs, those type of things. We would make sure that we identify the appropriate uh, things. And we also work with the, with the lenders after to make sure that they have a confidentiality agreement in place. Typically, we allow the lender, once the BNDA or CDA is in place, uh, two weeks so that their underwriters get thoroughly involved in data deals so that the term sheets that the lenders come back to us with are ones that they're fully committed to and would be able to, to accomplish um, based on their final due diligence. Uh, then we get into a negotiation stage. We have a proprietary model where we put our these deals in a side-by-side -side quantitative analysis and then we talk about also which of the what, which aspect is more important. Is it is it going to be financial flexibility versus equity component, or maybe even prepayment? Because we know the deal is probably going to get prepaid in a short period of time, or uh, whatever. We drive those, and then finally we we talk to the client about a strategy. We, we'll talk to the lenders and and inform them of what the outcome is, and then we get involved in the active due diligence process, which again, I said is about three to four weeks. So that's typically how we run these deals and the, we, it's been a successful model that we've been able to use. I think I'll pass this back to Stefan now at this point. Thanks, Rich. So this, this next series of slides is gonna kind of take you through that process and, and illustrate uh, how, how we go about it, and and uh, also probably um, just show how inefficient this this market can be. It's interesting the debt market is is sort of opaque. It's not it's not a market where there's a lot of published numbers or or transparency into into who's doing deals and when. Um, and and so the the benefit of us being in the market daily um, is kind of shown here in these in these next few slides, but. This specific deal that we're going to talk about was a, a device company that was uh, developing a novel approach to drug delivery, and and they wanted to help us uh, raise some debt while also completing an equity round at the same time. So, um, so we determined based on conversations with uh, management um, that you know we had to meet specific objectives, and and those objectives. Are, are listed here, but there's a couple of them that that I would stress, um, and that is they uh, were very uh, much not interested in warrants. <laughs> um, so so that equity component 
um, was going to have to be extremely low or, or nil. Um, and they also wanted to reduce or completely eliminate um, any prepayment penalties to, uh, to lower the cost of exiting the facility um, for, for a specific reason, which I'll explain. Um, but um, the, what, what we do when we start out, as, as Rich explained in the previous slide, is that we speak with our clients to understand what their priorities are in the deals um, because there's certain criteria that, that we know we can negotiate. Uh, but it's going to end up being a game of whack-a-mole. So if we push a couple of down, some others, some others may pop up. Um, and, and that's just part of the negotiation and, and what we help our clients understand as, as part of the process. But the idea here being that we're going to push on the points that matter most uh, to our clients. So like I said, in this case, this was warrant coverage um, and, and, and any prepayment penalties to really lower the cost of exiting the facility. So, uh, the next slide shows uh, the runway analysis that Rich mentioned earlier. So this was, um, you know, a simultaneous debt and equity round. So um, the, there was equity that closed, and we were looking at helping them raise 15 million in debt. Uh, it was a single tranche, and you know, knowing the terms of the transaction, we could uh, of most of the transactions that we were seeing in the market, we can uh, somewhat prognosticate what the runway extension would look like. Uh, based on current terms. So, you know, this, the specifics that we're using here were an 18 month interest only period, approximately 9% interest rate, um, with a, with a 10.8% IRR. So just to be clear, the IRR, um, is the, is the, um, internal return to the lender. So we calculate all the associated fees that, that could be incorporated in the deal. There's a typically a closing fee, um, sometimes a facility fee and then uh, sometimes a, a back end fee as well. So we include those, those are additive to the interest rate um, to get to the IRR. So we use those terms to show this runway extension and it was actually a, a great scenario for the company, you know, based on the, based on their projections because they, and here's the reason they wanted a cheap exit uh, or, or the least expensive exit that they could, that they could achieve is because they were looking at a commercial launch right around that July 18, August 18 timeframe. And you can see here that the debt facility provides um, about three months, uh, a little more than that uh, runway extension beyond that planned commercial launch date. Um, so, so this gives them that buffer that they needed, but also upon commercial launch, um, they're, they're considering at that point, you know, they would have FDA approval. Um, who knows, maybe they would be more appropriate for one of those larger structured finance type loans at that point um, to help them launch commercially, and then they'd have to refinance out of this, this facility here. So on the next slide, we just kind of take it down um, the, the top three proposals that we got. Um, we, I, we got several other proposals on this specific deal, but, you know, we're looking at closing fees, so standard 1% uh, of the size of the deal uh, as a closing fee. Um, everybody came in with certain warrant coverage, and, and you, you know, you'll remember that that, that was not, not of interest <laughs> in this particular deal. Um, and just, just to be clear, warrant coverage, when you see 3%, 6%, et cetera, uh, this is based on the size of the deal. So it's, it's shares priced at the previous financing round um, of, of 6%, whatever 6% of, of $15 million would be, the, not, not of the entire company. So I just want to make that clear. Um, then the IRR, again, um, you know, they came in sort of around the, the low double digit range, 10 to 11.8. Um, and again, just to reiterate, this is inclusive of all the fees. Um, but, uh, but then the rates, you can see lender three had the lowest rate, um, which all went all the way up to lender one with the highest rate. But, uh, but lender three with the lowest rate did not have the lowest IRR because of those associated fees. So um, that's an important consideration there. Um, so flipping to the next slide, this is our first round of negotiation. So um, nobody wanted to move on that closing fee after the first, first round. Um, the, uh, so lender three reduced their warrants by half. Um, obviously there was some motivation there to, to, to win this deal. So we went from 3% down to 1.5, lender one didn't move, lenders two moved by 2% on the warrants. 
Um, so all good cost savings for on those couple of lenders that are willing to reduce the warrants. Um, the IRR for lender three was the, is the only one that moved the rate. Um, and you can see that the IRR reduced by 38 basis points. Um, however, um, if I move over to the interest rate box, you can see that their actual rate increased. And this is because they lowered their final fee. Again, that was important to us in this deal. We wanted, a, we wanted the least expensive exit. So their rate actually increased while their our IRR decreased because they lowered their final fee by 2% in, the, in this case. Um, and then we go to the final round of negotiations. So, um, you know, we, we pushed and got uh, 20 basis points off of that closing fee, which was good. Um, we ended up with no warrants, uh, however, a 4% success fee. So again, this is the, uh, this is change of control or IPO. So the company was far more willing to pay a known amount in, in, in kind of a flat fee, a one-time payment, uh, upon that inflection point rather than, rather than give the unlimited upside of warrants. Obviously, they're very optimistic about their prospects here, and so that they would prefer to do 4% uh, one-time success fee than even give away 1.5% warrants on, on this deal. So um, so that's where we ended up there, we, which is the, the, the non-dilutive approach. Um, and then finally, we got them um, to lower their final fee yet another 2%. Um, so this is a 4% reduction in the final fee um, to an IRR of 10.8, and and I would say that was that was right on the mark. If you remember our, our runway analysis that we provided them at the beginning of the deal, the IRR was 10.8 that we uh, that we predicted for them. So uh, you know, uh, um, off by one basis point there. Um, and then and then the interest rate um, stayed at that at that 9.3 percent. But again, they're they're continuing to lower their final fee throughout. Um, and we got a prepayment penalty. Typically, prepayment penalties are three percent if you exit in the first year, two percent in the second, one percent the third. Um, they lowered the the second year exit, which is when this this company would hope to exit to uh, from two percent to one percent. So dramatically reduced the cost. Uh, across the board based on what these guys were looking for. Um, and then, you know, in, in comparing everything, um, you can see the market inefficiency here. So if on pure economics, if the company does in fact exit year two, um, from the first term sheet we, we got, most expensive, to the last negotiated terms, um, these guys are actually saving, you know, 730 plus thousand dollars. Um, so, so that's part of the inefficiency of the market, but also part of the the, the benefit of the negotiation um, and having multiple lenders um, at the table, understanding that they have to sharpen their pencils to uh, to win these deals. So, um, we thought that was a specifically good example there of, of, of how the process works. Uh, so, I'll pass it back to Rich to wrap it up. Oh, thank you, Stefan. Um, you know, what Stefan talked about there, I've really found uh, to be true. Uh, we've been able to, to get many deals where the uh, savings can be in in, in, uh, in over a million dollars. Um, one of the things, too, is that whenever lenders work with us, they know they're going to be held to a competitive uh, process. And so they even even though we were able to show 700000 I would venture to say that the first term sheet that is sent to us is more aggressive than they would normally be sent to an individual company where they're hoping to get a bluebird and not have competitive pressure they'll see with us. But we can still uh, negotiate significant savings from that first starting point. Um, finally, why should you use capital advisors? Uh, first, our market knowledge. We're as knowledgeable as anybody about this market, even more than most of the lenders themselves, because we can compare and contrast them. Uh, we're in this market on a daily basis, and it is one that changes all the time. Um, it's changed. I've seen significant change over the years, but even in short terms. Uh, it's, we take a fully customized uh, consultative approach. Our deal, each time we talk to a client, our deal is a little bit different. Our model changes because of the weighting of each of the aspects of, that are more important. Uh, so we're always able to, to make this reach what the client, what are the optimal terms for each of our individual clients. Finally, uh, you know, one of the things we provide is due diligence and independent counsel. A lot of our 
clients hire us because we run a process and we can show that we've done due diligence. A, pro a public company may be criticized for a debt deal. If they've done it with someone like us, they were able to show what that process was and how they can um, prove that they've done their due diligence. And finally, um, this independent counsel, again, going back to registered investment advisor, uh, we sit there always in tune with our clients' interests and, and we're required in, in, in to act in their fiduciary best interest at all times. Um, so that should wrap it up. I'm going to pass it back to Shane to see if we have any questions and go from there. Excellent. Thank you, Rich. Um, all right, so we'll move right into the Q&A session. Um, it looks like uh, there's a few questions that came in. Again, there should be a little module uh, in the GoTo uh, webinar box uh, on your screen. You can uh, feel free to type in any questions you may have, and then we can um, address them during this uh, Q&A. Um, so just looking here, one of the first questions that came in uh, is, what is your fee in the transaction? Rich, I'm sure I we, our fees. Yeah, no, our fees vary. Um, they they depend on a number of different things. Um, you know, how big is the deal? How much time is it going to take on our part? Um, what 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 uh, you know interest level is? Um, but we, they're always very reasonable. And uh, so and we've been asked many times to compare the fee to what the overall savings is. And I would say that we're able to usually save somewhere between four and six times our fee and savings pass along to the client and savings. Uh, not to talk about the also the the fact that by us head meeting something like this, the time savings on the client is much more significant. Okay. Thank you, Rich. Uh, next question is, uh, what was the term on the success fee? How long? that refers back to uh, you stuff. Yeah, so typically, um, like like warrants, there's a, there's an exercise period of, of ten years, um, but uh, that's the typical duration on these on these terms. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and the question here. Do you often see where an equity raise and a debt financing close at the same time? I'll, I'll be happy to handle that. Um, in essence, whenever there's a new equity round, a lot of uh, venture capitalists and senior managers are concerned about uh, non-dilutive, adding some, a non-dilutive portion of that round. Um, so we do see quite a few rounds close together. The way that it's typically structured is that the you know the lenders all the equity component always comes in first, and the lenders tend to follow. But based on the term sheets, we can make it happen almost simultaneously. But typically, the the debt will always follow the equity. Excellent, thank you, Rich. Um, that looks like that's all the questions. Um, if anyone else has on the call that has any more questions, feel free um, to uh, e them, e excuse me, email them over to either Rich or Stefan. Um, we're going to conclude the webinar for right now. Um, again, I will be sending out an email um, with a recording of this webinar um, for future reference, um, along with uh, Rich and Stefan's contact information. Uh, thank you again for joining us today, and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your week.